Okay, so welcome everybody. Uh, today I'm going to give a talk uh, on Woodlands Under the Waves, uh, a multidisciplinary research study into submerged forests uh, in the intertidal peaks in Orkney and in the Western Isles. So this is some research that I've been doing uh, for the last five or six years up in Orkney and more recently in the Western Isles, but it follows uh, quite a, a long period of study in submerged forests uh, where I've looked at sites in uh, Sussex uh, down at pet level, but also uh, a lot of work in the Severn Estuary, uh, mainly for my PhD, uh, and then back a little bit more recently to look at some footprint evidence uh, in there as well. So I'm going to get, give you an overview really uh, through the talk about what submerged forests are, about why they're important, particularly in terms of landscape change, but also in terms of the resources that people may have used within there. Uh, and I'm going to go through some of the techniques that we use to study uh, these places as well. So hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll not only know a bit more about the sites we've been working on and some of the results that have come out of there, but also you'll be more informed about what these sites are in terms of submerged forests, uh, and also the potential really uh, to talk about these in terms of landscape change uh, and also in terms of paleo-environmental methodology as well. So hopefully you'll get an overview about that throughout. So it's important to say, first of all, that this isn't just my research on my own. Uh, there's been quite a few people involved in this. Uh, so meet the team. Uh, as well, Caroline Wickham-Jones, you'll know already from previous talks, who's part of the work we've been doing in Orkney. And this work as well ties into a lot of research that Prue's been doing as part of the Rising Tides project uh, as well. So we've got Caroline from that. We've also got uh, people like Richard Bates uh, and Martin Bates, uh, <coughs> Sue Dawson as well. So we've got lots of institutes uh, and universities as part of this. Uh, Richard's at St. Andrews. Uh, Sue's at Dundee, uh, Martin is at Trinity St. David's, uh, we've got Jane Bunting as well from Hull, Michelle Farrell from Coventry, uh, Steve Davis from University College Dublin, and we've also got the SCAPE team as well down here as well, Tom, Joe and Ellie, uh, who were working with us uh, on the Western Isle stuff. <clears throat> so the first thing to consider then really is landscape in terms of these submerged forests. So we're going to start off looking at submerged forests really uh, in Orkney and then towards the end of the talk we're going to move across to the Western Isles. So this is a picture of modern day Orkney, uh, the map there, but really if you go back in time uh, into the Mesolithic you can see that actually it's quite different. So here we're looking at Orkney around about eight, ten thousand 10,000 years ago. Now all the red dots that are there are Mesolithic sites. So we can think of these now as being potentially coastal, but if we put them into the context for the Mesolithic landscape, you can see that actually not many of them are coastal uh, at all. And this is important to consider when we think about where the submerged forests are. So submerged forests essentially are remnants of past woodland that have been preserved in peat. Uh, <clears throat> they're preserved in, in peat bogs, not just in, in the intertidal zone, in the intertidal peats, but also uh, if you think of inland peat sites, if you think of places like the Flow Country, etc., at the bottom of those peats or near the bottom of those, you might find woodland remains, uh, such as a lot of the pine stumps that you'll probably be familiar with, having seen them come out of sections. So here's submerged forest sites that we know of uh, across Orkney. Now, I'm sure there's more than this, but these are the ones that we've, we've looked at, we've found in literature, but also we've been out uh, having a little walk around the coastline and, and finding these sites for ourselves. Uh, and as you can see there, there are some that look like they would have been coastal woodlands back in the Mesolithic, and there's some that were more inland sites. So this is going to have a, an effect on what kind of trees we find there as well. It's also a period of dynamic change when these submerged forests are around. So most of the forests date to the Mesolithic and into the early Neolithic uh, in Orkney. Uh, and as you can see, if we look at these Mesolithic sites, uh, if we push through time, we can see that the landscape changes quite rapidly. Uh, and as we go through the period of the Mesolithic with rising sea levels, uh, towards the end of the Mesolithic and then into the Bronze Age, we start getting more of the kind of coastline around Orkney that we're more familiar with. As you can see from those changes. So how do we measure this sea level change? So one of the things that the Rising Tides group have been particularly uh, working on over the last few years 
uh, it's trying to get a measure on sea level change and the rate of sea level change in Orkney uh, over the past 7,000, 8,000 years. Now, before they started doing this project, the only kind of sea level models that we had were from places like Caithness. Uh, so they're quite close, but they're, they're not going to be, uh, you know, they're not going to be bang on for, for what we're looking at in terms of Orkney. We should also say that this model is based on a, a number of dates from around Orkney. Uh, and if we were to start looking at a particular coast, a particular uh, island in particular, you know, specifically, then this might change as well. So this is kind of a model that's for Orkney, generally for Orkney as a whole. But if we went down to a kind of really local level, then we're going to get variations within that. And we'll talk about some of those variations uh, later on. So here's the dots. All these dots, uh, the Orkney points, are based uh, on intertidal peats. Uh, <clears throat> and where we're looking at these peats is what we're looking at what we call a relative sea level index point. So that's the top of the peat uh, that's exposed. Uh, and if we get a date on that, we know that at this point in time, that peat was dry land. So anything above that peat then uh, is when it's been submerged. Now, the ideal in these scenarios really is to get a date where the peat and the overlying marine sediments merge. But that's not always possible in these intertidal zones because of things like wave erosion. So a lot of the top silts have already been eroded away. Uh, and it might mean that the peats that we're getting is not the period in time where it's just been submerged, but it could be a period of time where it was terrestrial for quite a long time. But as we go down through the depths, so we're looking at you know going down the slope really uh, and trying to find those peats uh, further down, uh, we can get a radiocarbon date on those. So all these blue dots are those kind of radiocarbon dates, so this is when it's dry land. And if we put a general curve on that, uh, we can see that there's quite a rapid rise in sea level, change, sea level uh, from the Mesolithic period. Uh, and we can see that then steadies around towards the end of the Mesolithic uh, but it's still rising into the Neolithic period. And it's only really towards the end uh, of, <clears throat> of the Neolithic period into the Bronze Age, the middle to late Bronze Age, that it starts to steady, but it's still rising today. And we've still got that kind of problem uh, of sea level rise uh, in the islands. And of course, coastal erosion is quite a big thing, uh, particularly how it affects some of the archaeology around the coastlines. So if we look at the periods where most of our peaks date to, we can see that actually they fall into this period where we do have quite a lot of dynamic change going on. We're at a period in time where we have rapid sea level rise progressing into a slower sea level rise. And this is causing landscape change. So you'll have areas that maybe, you know, if you're a Mesolithic community, that maybe your grandparents knew was dry land. Uh, <clears throat> and by the time you're older, it's turning into you know, a wetland environment and maybe even turning into a coastal environment. So this is generational change that we might be seeing here in terms of how that landscape really is altering. And that obviously has an effect on resources that are available for people, but it also has an effect really on how people might move around that landscape. So you might have a, an area where you've got you know, one of these submerged forests where it's kind of wet woodland, uh, and that can be tricky to walk through, uh, but then if it becomes, you know, salt marsh, it might be a bit easier to walk through, uh, or you might have an area that's completely flooded, uh, and then you've got uh, to walk around it sort of thing. So you can see how, you know, the landscape could change and it could have an effect on how people move across that landscape. In terms of resources, you might be changing. So you might have a woodland resource that then suddenly changes to a wetland resource. Uh, so reeds might become more important. Uh, trees may be lost or become less important. So it really does have an impact uh, on that landscape. And one of the things that we always try to do in archaeology is to try and really get down to sort of generational levels to be able to see how it's changing, you know, ideally in periods of, you know, 30, 40 years, rather than the thousands of years that we often talk about. So we want to investigate this change. Uh, and this is part of this project uh, in terms of looking at the landscapes, looking at, uh, particularly in Orkney, where we're taking quite a big slice of the landscape to look at, uh, and also try and get a picture by looking at a number of these sites in, in individual places. So looking at submerged forests, though, is, is, it's nothing new uh, in a way. Uh, there was quite a, a large interest in submerged forests, particularly 
uh, in uh, the, the 19th century uh, and the early 20th century as well. So there's quite a lot of literature out there uh, to read on some of these uh, submerged forest remnants. One of the earliest accounts of submerged forests uh, in Orkney is this one by William Graham Watts. He was this fella who was the seventh laird of scale and was also the person who found uh, the <coughs> uh, Scar of Bray uh, as well. Uh, and in his uh, account of submerged forest, you can see that he gives some quite nice detail about what there is there. So you can see here he says it's partly embedded and lying on the surface of the moss. So the moss is the peat uh, in a horizontal position with the stems of several small trees about 10 feet in diameter and from five to six inches in diameter, sorry, 10 feet in length and five to six inches in diameter. So that suggests there was quite substantial tree remains buried in that peat uh, around uh, the Bay of Scale uh, into the early 19th century. And you, this is the great thing about these remnant forests as well, because they're in peat, the preservation can be very excellent. So not only can you find the trees, but you can find seeds, you can find leaves, you can find nuts, etc. Uh, and he says here, they're in a very decayed state, but a piece of one of them was so fresh uh, that Mr. Watt was able to ascertain it to be some kind of fir. And by fir there, they mean pine. So they're suggesting that some of these tree remains might be pine. Uh, this is exceedingly remarkable as no native specimen of any of the resinous or coniferous trees now exists, nor has perhaps for centuries existed in the Orkney Isles. So here as well, we're recognizing that not only do we have the remains of a woodland, We've also got the remains of trees that may no longer be present in Orkney, if indeed they were pine trees. Uh, and we can also recognise that this is a very different landscape. So at present, it's the Bay of Scale. Uh, but previously, this was a woodland landscape and may have contained pine trees. Now that submerged forest and peat is no longer really there in the Bay of Scale. It's very difficult to find any of that peat. That's left. The last study on this was uh, done uh, in the early 2000s and they found some peat uh, which was able to be dated to the Mesolithic uh, as well. Uh, there was a study uh, as well in the 70s uh, <clears throat> and they looked at the intertidal peat there uh, and they did find quite an elevated amount of pine uh, pollen. Unfortunately the wood had already gone by that point so they were just looking at the peat rather than the actual wood remains. Uh, so there are a few studies out there on these. Uh, Keating and Dixon was the one in the centres. Uh, interestingly, uh, William Graham Watt's wife was Anne Trail, uh, and another person who wrote about uh, submerged forest uh, in Orkney, particularly relating it back to folklore, uh, was Walter Trail Dennison. Uh, and he looked at uh, submerged forest in Otterswick uh, in Sandy. Uh, this is a peat that we have found. We've refound it, we've, we've redated it. So it does date to uh, the Mesolithic, the late Mesolithic. Uh, we took some samples. I'm still working on those samples. Uh, the tree remains there are willow trees. Uh, it seems to be quite a popular tree uh, for these areas. Uh, and Walter Adelson in 1893 was saying, there can be, however, no doubt that we have here the remains of trees that have one time grown and flourished at a level considerably above their present position. And there we can see again recognition of a different landscape of these now coastal landscapes which were wooded uh, at this period. Uh, and, and he wrote uh, an account of this in the Orkney Folklore and Sea Legend. So you can kind of see that, you know, already uh, at this point, these kind of lost landscapes are being relayed back to folklore. Uh, and in Cornwall, if we think of the Smudge Forest there, uh, relating it back to places like Leoness. So there's quite uh, a lot of interest in relating these back to lost lands. Uh, and thinking about it in that aspect. Uh, and interestingly, Walter Trail Dennison says, this is no isolated instance of submerged trees being found in Orkney. So you can see that people are already talking to each other. Uh, and it's most likely that communities knew uh, about where these places were, about these remains. Uh, and even today, we still get a few people ringing up uh, and letting us know that things are becoming exposed and that there's peats around. And that's, that's really interesting because it enables us to continue mapping these uh, as well and, and then it increases the number of sites that we might be able to go and have a look at in the future. Some of them it's quite tricky because they're, they're always submerged, so it's quite difficult to get to them, but others, the tide recedes off them for periods of time that enables us to go and get some samples. Probably the most uh, in-depth look at submerged forests in this period is the book by Clement Reed uh, called Submerged Forests, 
Uh, it came out in 1913. As far as I know, there hasn't been any more books published, you know, completely about submerged forests. Uh, <clears throat> Clement looked at sites in England, particularly South England uh, as, and into the Thames. Uh, he didn't get as far as Scotland in this book. So there, there we, these were good records for submerged forests inside of peats uh, in, in England. Uh, but unfortunately, there isn't any such study as Scotland. But again, there's lots of papers and you know, antiquarian papers that we can go to to try and find these and, and get some maps. And, and I'll show you an example of some work that we've done on that uh, later on. <clears throat> so going back to Orkney then uh, and thinking about where these are located, uh, we can use Walter Trail Denison's papers to locate a few. So, uh, for instance, Otterswick Bay. Uh, as well here on Sandy, this is the Swedish Forest Walk Trail Dense was talking. There's the Bay of Scale, which is the one that William Graham Watt was talking about. But you can also see that there's quite a few dotted around. Uh, and once you get a kind of feel for uh, the location, so you're thinking about shallow bays, not a lot of uh, <coughs> tidal action in terms of, you know, really smashing it. Uh, what we're thinking here is kind of more shallow. So you do get erosion of sediments, but it's not completely removing them. And once you kind of find a couple of these, you can pretty much get your map out, point to a site and go and check it out. And, and, and more likely than not, you will find uh, new sites there. And it shows you that there is extreme potential here to really find out a lot uh, about former environments, to find out about these lost lands uh, in places like Orkney and indeed all around the coastline of Scotland and England as well, and indeed Wales and Northern Ireland and into Europe. So it's got so much potential here. Uh, and when we put these sites then against uh, our map, uh, our Mesolithic map, uh, again, we can see that we're talking about intertidal sites that were not always intertidal sites. <clears throat> so in certain locations, they were more inland dryland sites uh, than they are now. So we always have to kind of bear in mind, you know, the landscape that we're recreating uh, and that we're recreating terrestrial landscapes and we're looking for that change from the terrestrial into a maritime landscape but we may not get it because those sediments may not exist. But we have to kind of think about it that way in terms of the overall uh, interpretation of our results. So here's an example of an intertidal peat. This is the peat here. Uh, this is a site that's actually uh, down at DNS. It's a, it's a new site that we found uh, a couple of years ago. We went out with some of our master students on here and we found that the peat here is about a meter thick, which is good for an intertidal peat site. A lot of intertidal peat sites can range from depth of peats. It's not unusual to have sites that are only five centimeters thick to 20 centimeters thick uh, to a meter thick. So, you know, there is variation in, in these as well. And because we have these intertidal peats, it means that we can throw a lot of methodology out there at them in terms of trying to get uh, an understanding of these landscapes. Uh, and if we can pick up any evidence for people within those landscapes as well, and, and how people were interacting with those woodland environments. So we can do things like coring and augering. So here I am out on an inside of peat uh, and I'm doing some augering. Uh, and here what we're trying to do is we push a gouge auger manually down into the ground. It has an open chamber. Uh, this is the open chamber. I might be able to zoom in a little bit. So this is the open chamber. You can see it's already gone into the ground a fair bit. We're just trying to push it down. We turn it, we bring it up. We can record a meter at a time. And within that open chamber, we can see the change in stratigraphy. So here we're looking at not only the thickness of this intertidal peat here, but does this intertidal peat change? So have we got a repeat layer, a wood peat layer? Is it a, a heath peat layer? So we're looking for those kind of changes. We're also looking to see if there's been marine incursions maybe, because maybe this is one of those sites that wasn't that far away from the coast during the Mesolithic Neolithic. So do we have evidence of marine clays in there? Uh, do we have evidence of silts as well? Uh, do we have that top evidence? I mean, you can see here, this is the top of the peak. We haven't got a nice marine silt on top of it. It's been eroded away. So we don't have that complete contact of when this land became submerged. But there might be other evidences in there. If we think about peats, such as in the Severn estuary, they have, you can have up to five different peat bands. Uh, and in between that, layers of estuarine silt suggesting that you have these periods where it's terrestrial, then it's marine, then it's terrestrial, then it's marine. So you can have fluctuations in sea level. You don't always get one smooth transition. 
We can also look at tree remains. So these are the submerged forests, and we'll, we'll have a look at some submerged forest trees in a, in a bit. Uh, when we get those, we need to identify what wood it is. So we have to look at wood identification. Because we've got peat, we can do pollen uh, and, and look to see what the vegetation was like. This is a, a birch pollen grain here. It's nice and round with three pores, and little chambers. Uh, we can also, this is wood uh, identification. So doing the wood identifications, we can look for things like scleriform plates. So we'll, we'll have a chat about where we see those in a little while. We can also look at things like non-pollen palynomorphs. So when we're recording a pollen, we're not just recording pollen grains, but we're also recording things like fungal spores, uh, things like testates, uh, things like algae, uh, and a range of other uh, microscopic remains that appear on these slides. And the more of these we can record, then the more information we can get out of these things. So we can go right from things that could be quite regional in their signal to things that are very, very local in their signal as well. In terms of getting that very local signal, we can also look at waterlogged plant remains. So these are the remains of seeds. They're also the remains of other bits of wood that are in there. So you might get bits of branch that have fallen down. You want to identify those. Uh, you might get hazelnuts uh, as well. Uh, and you might also get uh, <clears throat> things like buds and bud scales uh, as well uh, surviving. So all these things can add, add that signal. And, and often the, the waterlogged plant remains are very local because seeds don't move as far as pollen normally. Uh, they're, very small, they're, very, they're not as small as pollen. Uh, and then only fall straight down to where you're looking at. So you can get that very local uh, signal from those. It's also very good to do that because, uh, for instance, this is a birch pollen grain. I can't tell you what tree type it is other than birch. I can't say if it's downy birch. I can't tell you if it's silver birch. We can't get that from pollen. We can maybe we can say if it's dwarf birch by measuring it. But in terms of the, the, the tree types that are there, uh, it'd be difficult to do that. Uh, the wood is also the same, so I can tell you it's a birch tree, but I can't tell you it's a silver birch or a downy birch tree. Whereas if we get the seeds and we've got the little wings on them, uh, we can identify that it's a silver birch to a downy birch. So it, the more data you have, the more you can get down to species level. I mean, pretty soon we might be doing DNA off these uh, and identifying them that way. Uh, environmental DNA is, very, uh, is coming on quite a lot. Uh, and we can also uh, look at charcoal, so microscopic charcoal fragments. Uh, this is a microscopic charcoal fragment here, uh, and sometimes microscopic charcoal fragments retain structure. And what I mean by retain structure is that they, they retain the wood anatomy structure that enables us to identify tree types. So, for example, you just about be able to make out that this has bars going across it. You can see it's got two sides, it's got bars going across it. If we move up and have a look at our wood anatomy, you can see that this feature uh, within the wood is called a scleriform plate and it's an oval feature and it's got these bars going across it uh, and you can see that in this instance this is an alder tree you can see that the the bars uh, are quite tightly packed together and there's quite a lot of them uh, and if we look at our bit here we can see those bars are closely packed together we haven't got the whole plate so we don't know how many there are on here but we could suggest this is something like birch or alder so the main thing is that Yes, we've got charcoal we can tell is burning. Because we've got a bit of charcoal that has retained structure, we can tell it's wood charcoal that's burning. So getting that difference between wood and grasses being burnt is quite interesting. Uh, and because it's got, it's part of a scleriform plate, we can even say that's birch or alder trees that are being burnt. So if you've got a lot of birch pollen in your slides and you've got birch wood and you've got charcoal like that, then chances are you've got birch that's being burnt. And birch is quite a popular tree uh, in Orkney. And lastly, we can also look at beetles and insects. So they're quite useful because, again, uh, they can move around uh, a lot, but they, they have different ecological niches. So some uh, are aquatic, some like woodland, some like fen conditions, some are related to animal dung. So we might, again, get that kind of inference that there's animals grazing on our site, and we might link those to our non-pollen palynomorphs down here for dung indicators as well. So we can get multiple data uh, around that to try and work out what's happening in our landscape uh, and what's affecting change as well. So we might start seeing change uh, in our pollen records and that change could be that we've got a loss in trees. So what's causing that loss in trees? Is it people clearing that woodland? Is it a rise in sea level affecting groundwater that's drowning trees? Uh, is it climate? You know, so there's, there's lots of, uh, you know, there's lots of different interpretations, but so we need to get as much evidence as we can to support our interpretations uh, and make it as valid as possible. So this is uh, one of the sites we'll be talking about, uh, the Bay of Ireland. Uh, and here's some uh, students doing some auguring. 
Uh, this one's, he's gone quite ambitious here. He's put quite a few rods on uh, to try and get it into the ground. Uh, I would probably start off with a few less than that. Uh, but here we can see, you know, that we can we can start mapping peat out. So the idea here is that we're trying to look for the, the thickness of the peat. So where is it deeper? Where is it thinnest? But also, where is it contained? You know, is it that we've got peat spread out across the whole of this area? Or is it only within a small area? Because what we're trying to do here is map the underlying topography. And we might call this the paleo topography. And what's that showing us is what this landscape would have looked like, you know, thousands of years ago. So thousands of years ago, we've got an intertidal peat here. So we know it was once terrestrial. We've got tree remains. So we know it was once a woodland. Uh, but how extensive was that woodland? Is it quite a small pocket of woodland? Is it quite a spread out woodland? Uh, where does the peat go to? Have we got, you know, a reed swamp that takes over this whole area? Or have we got, you know, a small pocket of trees that are growing here? So it's important to try and get that information. So it all adds to our, our interpretation of what these peats are. Because yes, we can we can say where intertidal peats are located and we might get a, a couple of dates on that intertidal peat. But to try and get, you know, a real grounding of, of, of what that represents, of what that past surface would have looked like, we need to do this auger work. Once we get the trees themselves, uh, we have to identify those. Now, if anybody ends up listening to this who worked with us out on Ben Becula uh, and did some of the Wood ID workshops uh, that we did every night, uh, they'll be very familiar with this kind of thing. Uh, but it's always worth going over because uh, when you're taking samples from uh, trees uh, or even pieces of wood, uh, I remember uh, when I was at Reading University and uh, my supervisor had brought me some Wood ID samples. Uh, from one of the submerged forests in Wales uh, over in Rill, which turned out to be oak. Uh, he brought almost entire tree stumps uh, into <laughs> back with him uh, into the lab. But we only need something that's about two centimetres cubed. So all we're looking at is something about a centimetre cubed, two centimetres cubed. Uh, and that's a good enough uh, piece of wood for us to get the IDs from. So when you're identifying uh, wood, the first thing you need to do is when you've got your piece of wood, is kind of turn around and, and try if you can see where the rings are. So try and get it in an upright position and see where those growth rings are. And once you've got that, you'll be able to take your sections. So <clears throat> this is the same with charcoal as well, by the way, if you were doing charcoal, you would fracture it and put it on a microscope and a, on a, under a metallurgical microscope. But here we're doing waterlogged wood, which is quite nice and cuts quite easily. Uh, so we use a razor blade and we take three sections. So the first section we take is this transversal section. Uh, and this is where the rings are. So this is the top section. Then we take one down the side, which is our tangential section. And then once you're taking the top and the side, you go in at a 90 degree angle and take the radial section. So those are the three sections that you need for any wood identification. So when people give you little bits of wood that are really quite thin, uh, you're not gonna get these. You're not gonna get the, the three sections. You might be able to get one section and have a bit of a guess. Uh, but really need these three sections. And, and again, when you think of charcoal as well, you know, yes, we can radiocarbonate smaller and smaller things now, but you do need a good sized piece of charcoal to be able to get your identification in as well. And that's quite important in terms of charcoal and archaeology because you want to get small branch wood to radiocarbon date. You don't want to get heartwood from an oak tree, for example, because that could be a lot earlier than your site. So you're after those small branch wood. So if you can see the rings, then you, you're onto a winner. So these are the three sections in the microscope. These are the three sections that we would see for hazel trees. So the first thing we've got here is we've got the transversal section, and this is our growth ring that's coming through here. Uh, and the first thing you can notice is there's not a lot of difference in, in one season's growth. There's lots of these small pores that are, are in this section. If we were looking at something like an oak tree, for example, we'd have massive pores down here, and they would get smaller as we go into winter. Then as we get to the new season's growth, we have massive pores again. Uh, and therefore it's a lot easier to see those rings uh, when, when, we're, when we're doing things like dendrochronology. Whereas things like willow, alder, hazel, uh, they're what we call semi-diffuse porous or diffuse porous. And that means they have lots of these little pores everywhere and none of these massive ones. Uh, and they can also put on more than a year's growth they can put on false rings as well. So it's very hard to match these trees against each other if we were trying to do dendrochronology. And often, particularly with alder and that, it's quite difficult to actually see the rings themselves when you're doing this. So with things like oak and with pine, it's a lot easier. 
to do that. And that's why we, we kind of use those trees uh, for our dendrochronology. Uh, and of course, with oak, we've got the long chronology. And with pine, people like Coralie and people like Ann Mills and Anne Crone are developing that long chronology and Andy Moore and that as well, particularly in Scotland. But there's other trees that we could use that are present in submerged forests, like ash would be a good one to use. You might have some potential as well. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's worth us trying to get those kind of trees and, and use them. So once we've got our transversal section, so the, the key thing that we take away from us in this section for identification purposes is that it's diffused to semi-diffused porous. So that's the first thing we'd hit on our key. Uh, and then we want to look at the tangential section. So this is the tangential section over here. And what we're looking at here is the ray type. So here we're looking at the width of the rays. Uh, and what you can see here, these, they look a bit like little worms coming through. Uh, and you can see they've, they've got one circle uh, just over here. They're one circle wide. So these are what we call uh, uniseriate rays. And if we look to the side, we can also see that it has ones that have got two circles or three circles. So it's got uniseriate, but it's also got what we call bi to triseriate. Now, if it was oak, it would have uniseriate and one massive multiseriate as well, like so multiseriate and uniseriate. If it was alder, it would only have uniseriate. If it was birch, it would be all of these. Again, mainly by and try with a few uniseriate. If it was willow, it don't have uniseriate. So we can start matching them up to our key. And then if we go across onto this side, we can start seeing features like scleriform plates. And what you'll notice about these scleriform plates in comparison to the one we just saw is that they're very wide and there's less of them in terms of the bars. So they're very wide and there's less of them. So Hazel normally has eight to 10 bars, and we can see that here. Whereas if we were looking at something like Alder, it'd be 16 to 24 bars, for example. So once we've taken those three sections and we've seen things, uh, we can also look at ray type uh, up here. We can put it, start putting it together and say, okay, we have got uh, diffuse porous <coughs> growth rings. We've got uni to bi to triseriate rays. We've also got scleriform plates that are eight bars. You know, if we were putting that in our key, that would key us out as hazel. So these are the features that we use then to identify our trees. Uh, and once you get pretty confident in, in cutting, so it's mainly using the razor blade to thinly slice these, look on the microscope, that's the, the tricky part. Uh, once you get it up to speed, you can do, you know, a fair few of these IDs in a day. And we were seeing that with volunteers getting very more confident as they went through uh, in the work we did in Ben Becula. So what other information can we get from trees then? So once we've got our site, we've identified the trees they are, uh, but the trees themselves can give us information. So these are some uh, big trees that we can see uh, from places like the Seven Estuary and from Pet Level uh, as well. Uh, the, this is an oak tree from Redwick. This is a, an early Mesolithic oak tree. Uh, and the first thing we can see from this is that it's very straight. That's a very straight tree uh, <clears throat> and it's grown pretty fast. So what we can look at here is evidence for woodland density. So if you're a tree that's in a quite a tightly packed canopy, uh, in order to survive, you've got to reach that canopy pretty fast. So you've got to grow up straight and tall. Uh, and the way I like to think about the, these kind of oak trees is to kind of think about the pine trees that we see now, because pine trees, uh, they tend to grow tall and straight very much so. Uh, and this is what our, our oak trees would have looked like back in the Mesolithic. We don't really have oak trees like this anymore in the UK. When we think of the oak tree, we think of like the majestic oak in its field. It's got quite a large canopy and it branches quite low. So one of the things we can look at in these trees is when does the first branch occur? So straight away, the first thing we can do when we look at the trees, we've identified the root bowl. You can see where the root bowl is straight away. And you can measure from the root bowl up the tree to see where the first branches occur. Now, if it's a tree that's growing in a nice open location, you'd expect branching to be fairly early on. So within a metre, metre and a half off the ground, you'd expect to start seeing branches of trees appearing uh, because they've got the space to go into. But if you're in a quite densely packed canopy, you're not gonna branch early, you're gonna grow straight and then branch high. So what we find for the trees down the seven is that a lot of their branching is two to two and a half metres up the trees where you get the first evidence of branching. So that's suggesting they're in tight woodland areas. And that's important because as you can see from this photo, that tree is no longer within a dense woodland canopy. So there's not lots of trees uh, all around it that are suggesting that. We do get some of that evidence from stumps. And we sometimes see stumps that are, that are quite packed together. Uh, and that's very interesting. We also see stumps that are sometimes one on top of the other. So we can actually see evidence of woodland succession in place as well. Uh, so it really gives us a picture of what it would have been like to be within these woodlands. 
On the right here, we've got a different tree. This is an older tree, uh, and this is from pet level. This is actually a Bronze Age tree. Uh, but again, you can see it's actually quite straight. It's growing quite tall and quite straight. But what you might also note around it is there's evidence of these branches that have fallen off. So if we, if we look in, you can see there's bits of branch coming up here, bits of branch lying around. Uh, and when we measure from the ground, uh, so this is, we can see the tree tapers, we can see where the root bowl would have been. Uh, we can measure up and it actually has branches that occur quite early on. So this is starting to branch at about a metre, metre and a half, suggesting that it's actually in quite an open woodland. So it's still, you know, it's still a woodland, uh, but there's more light getting through this woodland. It's not as dense canopy uh, as we can see elsewhere. So it's definitely a different type of woodland to the Mesolithic. And that's important to recognize that as we go through the inside of peats, depending on the kind of tree remains we're seeing and the dates of the peats, that we're gonna have a different kind of woodland experience uh, when we think about what's there. We can also get interesting evidence for things like storminess. So storminess is something that's quite difficult to pick up in pollen records because when a tree falls down and you get a loss in, in, in tree pollen, it, it doesn't, it's not always that easy to see uh, within a pollen record. It gets drowned out by the signal of other trees. And if you've got a woodland that's, you know, uh, say it's potentially all oak or, or mainly all oak, you know, if, if you lose a couple of oak trees, it's not going to have a massive impact on, on, the, on the pollen unless your, your pollen coring site is right next to where that tree was in the past. And then you might see uh, more of an impact. So it's quite tricky to pick this up and it's quite tricky to differentiate between the impacts of storms falling, uh, <coughs> falling over trees and of people felling trees as well. So it, it can be quite interesting uh, to try and, uh, and try and recognize that in pollen records. Uh, one thing I've, I think you can do in terms of that is looking at the amount of dead wood fungi uh, that you might get. So if you've got a lot of trees that are being felled, you'd expect to see an increase in dead wood fungi, a lot of dead wood on the ground after a period of storminess. Whereas if that land's being cleared, then maybe you'd expect to see less dead wood on the ground because that, you know, an area's being used for another purpose. So that's something that maybe we can test in the future. However, with the tree stumps themselves, you can often pick up evidence for storm damage. So you can see here two, two tree stumps uh, from different areas in Seven Eshi, one at Goldcliffe and one at Redwick. Uh, and the first thing you can see is that they're lent over. They've, they've bent over straight away. Uh, and if you look closely, you can also see that there's breaks in the root systems here. So if we can zoom in, we can see there's gaps. You can see a break there in the roots, but it's not stopped the tree from growing, but it has cracked the tree roots. And, and again, you can see that uh, on the one from Goldcliffe here, you can see quite a large crack. You can see it's not killed off the tree, but it has caused it to bend over. So these trees were probably still growing at the time, uh, but we can see direct evidence for, for wind snap uh, on, on these trees. So, you know, it, it's this kind of information that we can get from submerged forests that we really can't get any other way. We can't really get that from a pollen diagram uh, or a macrofossil diagram. You know, that's that's direct evidence of impact of storminess. And it also shows us that, you know, it, storminess had an impact on woodland in the past. Uh, which sometimes we may not recognize. Uh, one of the key things that we also can do on sites to try and date uh, trees, particularly as we were saying earlier, uh, oak trees and, and things like pine trees, is we can use dendrochronology. So here what we're trying to do uh, is find trees that are suitable to get a date from. Uh, and this is down at pet level, uh, and we've got some oak trees that we've identified. Uh, oak is quite easy to identify. Uh, from uh, things like alder and that when you're on uh, <laughs> walking through a submerged forest. So if you see a tree that's really quite black uh, and dark and when, you, and when you press your finger, you can do the finger test. If you, if you press your finger into it, it doesn't give at all. It's really solid uh, and you can tap it, then it's probably going to be oak. Oak also has what we call raised rays. So if the bark's gone, you get these, these rays that are kind of like little grooves. So kind of think of it as like an upright cone. And when you run your finger across it, you can feel the grooves uh, again. So that again is an indicator that you've got oak. If you've got things like alder and willow trees, if you do the press test, your, your finger will push into it and it will have give in it as well. So you can kind of recognize it that way. So on this side, what we were hoping to do uh, with the dendrochronology really is to get a date on uh, when these trees were growing and hopefully the extent of that period of woodland. So right from the earliest woodland, so going down to the bottom of the foreshore towards the top of the foreshore uh, and trying to find those dates. So we, in this period, we identified, we took 20 samples uh, from oak trees. 
So again, here's the oak tree. You can see, you know, the color of it. I'm saying it's quite black and you can see it really is uh, quite dark here. It's got a lot of growth on the top of it. It really is very solid. So what we do is we dig a pit underneath the tree uh, and often it's quite deceiving. So these remains that you see on the top, you think, oh, okay, it's not gonna take very long because it's not that big. And then when you start digging underneath it, you know, it, the, the trunk widens and it actually can turn into a pretty big job. And you have to get, you know, the pit wide enough and, and down underneath the tree enough so that the, the chainsaw can go in uh, without, you know, a lot of sand and things clogging up the chainsaw and you having to change the, the blade and everything uh, a lot. So you don't want to completely destroy your chainsaw. You want to want to get enough in there. Uh, and here you can see stumps are quite good because you don't have to dig those pits as much and you can take a nice wedge uh, through a stump. But the reason that we use the chainsaw on these oak trees is because they're so tough and that it's very difficult, you know, to do it, do it with a handsaw, uh, for instance. Uh, so here's some footage of us taking a dendro sample through one of these Mesolithic trees. You see how tough it is. And there we go, just the finished sample. So you can see it is really hard to get through that and that's with a chainsaw. So you try handsawing one of those, and it's quite it's quite difficult. You're not, you're not really gonna get through many in a day uh, without getting a very tired arm and shoulder, I imagine. So what we're looking for as well when we take these samples is to get a good match. You wanna get trees that have got at least 50 rings. So we're looking for 50 to 100 plus rings for these oak trees. And that enables us to get the best chance of matching it against the, the British chronology. Now on this site, uh, we took 20 samples. Uh, obviously we've got dates from the Mesolithic through to the Bronze Age, so it's quite difficult. Uh, out of the 20 samples we found, we only had two lots of two trees that matched against each other. Uh, and this is the trouble. So, you know, we only had two lots of two. So these, you know, tree 129 and 121 matched against each other. Tree 130 and tree 11 matched against each other. None of the other trees matched against those two trees or against each other. And this shows you the amount of work that you have to do to create that. So what we ended up doing is we took uh, radiocarbon dates then of trees. So we took some radiocarbon dates from either end of these two sequences uh, and this two sequences and cover the others. And what we found is that we had such a wide spread of dates from uh, the late Mesolithic through to the mid Bronze Age uh, that we'd have to subsample even more trees to try and get those matches against. So we're trying to get a few more trees that match against some of the others and establish a floating chronology for the site. So a floating chronology, uh, so these are very small floating chronologies. They're where the trees match against each other, but they don't match against that the British chronological record. So we can't fit them into that yet, but if we, you only need that one Rosetta stone tree that matches against that record, that matches against your trees, and you can fit it in. And this is the, the trouble that we have with a lot of these. Uh, submerged forest sites is trying to get enough trees to then match it against uh, some of these other records. But we can use radiocarbon dating to go through that. So again, you know, it's, we can, there's there's more, you know, we've got radiocarbon dates, we've also got dendro dates, etc. that we can potentially use to look for when these trees uh, were growing and what happened to them. So the other thing we want to do is look at the rings, particularly towards the end of the tree's life, because, you know, if they're all growing quite nicely and you've got nice wide growth rings, then that suggests the tree was growing quite happily uh, and conditions were good. Uh, and then maybe the tide came in very rapidly and drowned these landscapes and that's what happened and they failed. Or was there a sequence of very narrow ring events for these trees where they really struggled to grow for quite a long period of time because the hydrology of the area was changing up and down. 
Uh, oak trees, for example, will tolerate getting wet, but they don't like to be consistently wet. You know, so, so we can look to see, you know, uh, <clears throat> how that, again, what environmental impacts we're having on these trees uh, and, and what caused their demise. So these are all really important things to think about in terms of these landscape changes. And then the key one that we use really is pollen analysis. So if you've got peach, you're going to do pollen. Uh, <clears throat> and again, you can get a wide variety of pollen. So this is just a, a few different pollen taxa really to show you that uh, pollen has different, uh, it can be spiky, it can have these etchine, and, and it, it <clears throat> or it can have uh, smooth outer walls, but it can have these pores. These have archae, uh, all does the only one that has archae. Uh, this is uh, dandelion pollen. By the way, if you want to know what dandelion pollen is like, uh, we can have uh, lime trees as well. So this has got these three pores, uh, and it's got this nice uh, super reticulate pattern uh, on it as well. And then we can have grain that have these little ears, these pores with furrows, uh, and it has these striations. Uh, so this is a cynic foil pollen. So the range, the different morphology, uh, the different number of pores, for example. See, these have three, these have four and five. Uh, the different uh, <clears throat> structures that they have enable us to identify pollen down to type. Now, as I said before, it's very difficult to often get pollen down to species level, and that's where the, the macrofossils come in. Uh, but you can get, you know, long sequences of vegetational change through these, and that's what's, in, you know, it's an important record then for taking, you know, paleoecological studies uh, Back hundreds of years. When we think of e ecology and modern ecology, you know, a long period of time is about 10 years, 20 years. You know, we're talking thousands of years. So we can get these long term vegetation changes. And that really shows us about when these woodlands existed, uh, what happened to them, and about landscape change as well. And there's been quite a few policies uh, across Orkney. So this is uh, some of Michelle Farrell's PhD work. Uh, <clears throat> and we can see here there's been uh, approximately 30 studies. Uh, across Orkney. We can also see that a lot of them are based on the western mainland uh, of Orkney. Uh, there's still a few islands that don't really have decent pollen records, so, you know, get in there and, and get some of those records. Uh, <clears throat> only three pollen studies have taken place from intertidal peats uh, as well, and two of those are pretty much at the same location. So when we think about Anne de la Vega's work and, and Keating and Dixon's work at the Bay of Scale, which we spoke about earlier, and then Anne de la Vega also did some work uh, down at Scapa as well, and the beach just behind Scapa as well. Uh, and there's only been really one from a submerged forest site, and, and that really is the, the Keating and Dixon, but of course that those trees disappeared by that point in time. So, you know, when they were doing their work, it was a long time after, you know, over 100 years after uh, uh, Watt had discovered those possible pine remnants there. Uh, <clears throat> so there's a few of the uh, sites that I've been looking at. Uh, one of the questions that Michelle looked at as part of a PhD really was, you know, what happened to woodland in Orkney? There's a kind of almost an old wives' tale that uh, the Neolithic happened and woodland disappeared in Orkney. Uh, but we know that's not true because we have charcoal, uh, you know, from sites into the Iron Age in Orkney. I was looking at some uh, willow charcoal uh, the other day from the Cairns Brock site uh, as well. So we know there are some trees surviving. Uh, and one of the things Michelle looked at is she plotted uh, these pollen diagrams uh, and looked at, you know, when did the woodland go? Uh, so we've got all these green dots at the bottom uh, and, and the red dots. And the red dots suggest that woodland uh, went and it was in the shape of Batman's uh, cowl, uh, <laughs> if you look at it. Uh, but you can see that it, this is the, the first time that woodland declines in these, in these pollen profiles. And you can see straight away that's not a straight line. Uh, so it was disappearing at different times. Uh, we can see here that you know there's, there's periods where into the into the late where it's disappearing in, in the towards the end of the Mesolithic, and then we've got periods where it's surviving into the Bronze Age uh, as well. And that's just on these pollen records. And you have to remember from that pollen map that it's not covering the whole of Orkney. There's quite a lot of Orkney that doesn't have good coverage yet. We can also see this evidence for secondary decline. So that's when there's been a primary decline in woodland. Uh, the woodland has recovered. Uh, and then it's it's disappeared again, and sometimes that's quite short. So, for example, uh, on this site here, uh, we can see that it's actually quite short between the first decline and second decline. And in this site here, we can see that actually it's quite a long gap between the first decline and the second decline. So it can take quite a period of years. Uh, and then we think that this woodland often gives way to heathland communities. That seems to be the vegetational succession. So after uh, the trees have gone and and there's peat. Uh, uh, growth, uh, we often see this development into a heathland community. 
Uh, and we can see again that Heathland community started, you know, right the way back into the Mesolithic, uh, and then you know were, were very prominent, you know, towards the later prehistoric period. Uh, and those later uh, prehistoric period records are very thin on the ground in Orkney as well. So we have a lot of records that cover the Mesolithic Neolithic, which is good for our submerged forest studies because then we've got comparanda that we can look at in, in terms of other woodland evidence. But in terms of uh, sites, Iron Age sites in, in Orkney, we, we've only got two or three pollen studies that cover that period. So there's still lots of potential for more pollen work uh, in, in, across Orkney uh, and, and to recognise that there's still research questions to answer. Uh, this is some work that, uh, that Jane Bunting and Michelle Farrell have been doing uh, as well using pollen data from Orkney. And what they've done here is they've started to use uh, the, the, the pollen profiles that we have. So as we were looking at earlier, there's quite a lot of records of, of pollen from West Mainland. So we can use that in new and exciting ways. Uh, and one of the things they've been doing is, is using those different cores to model the pollen data. So gathering all the information from those pollen cores through different slots in time, we can start thinking about how wooded was Orkney during this period? And when did that woodland start to change? So the dots that you can see here uh, are not saying this is exactly where woodland occurred. So if we go back to 4100 BC, so start, almost the start of the Neolithic, uh, we can see it's actually quite a lot of woodland around. So the, the, the greener the dot, uh, the more sort of woodland was present. Uh, and then the, the, the lighter the dot, we're talking more kind of open woodland, maybe scrub woodland. Uh, and then, you know, we'll also start plotting uh, open grassland. So you can see it's quite open by this point in time, but there are pockets of woodland that are there, suggesting that when Neolithic people came to Orkney, there's still quite a lot of wood resources around, which is quite interesting because if we look at sites like the Nesabrodka, almost from the beginning of that site, they're using turf to burn rather than the wood. So people are also making these choices these uh, about what fuel uh, and woodland resources they're using. Then as we go through time from these diagrams, uh, towards the end of the Neolithic, we can see that actually it's a much more open landscape. So there's less of those large green dots and more of these small green dots, suggesting that there's some little pockets of scrub woodland uh, and that around, uh, but, but maybe not so much. So we can see you've got mainly grassland, uh, but there's still a, a fair bit of woodland knocking about, but kind of lesser. Uh, so <clears throat> in terms of then submerged forests, uh, what we can what they're showing you is they're showing you the actual woodland. So we can start plotting dots and we can start you know, suggesting what the density is, but in order to understand what the woodland canopy was like, uh, we have to go to the submerged forests because that is the actual woodland from this period. Uh, we can also use these non-pollen palynomorphs. Uh, so they accompany pollen. Uh, and again, they can tell you things like uh, dung. So we get things like Sordaria type and Sarcophora type, these little torpedo and rugby ball shaped uh, fungal spores, and they're associated with animal dung. So if we start seeing peaks of these, then maybe we're, we're looking at maybe the grazing animals, if we're in the Mesolithic, uh, or, or in the Neolithic, maybe cattle, livestock, uh, the impact of those. We can also things like Galicinospora, uh, which like dry conditions. So often after you've got a burning event, you often see these uh, appearing, so the local dry conditions after burning. And again, our microscopic charcoal, that can really be used to you know, give fire history uh, and, and indicate past fire events. But again, you can, if it retains structure, so this is what we saw earlier, birch and alder, uh, and here, fir, uh, abies as well, uh, we can start saying you know, exactly what's being burnt. So maybe we can say that it's wood being burnt, maybe grasses that are being burnt if we get the structure, but at least we can say that was burning in the environment. And the usual rule of thumb is that the larger the charcoal pieces that you're seeing, the closer you are to that actual burning event. So if you've only got a few small, very small fragments of microscopic charcoal, then you're probably quite far away from a burning event and it's maybe it's just sort of background. But if you start getting masses and masses of charcoal, and it's all quite large, then you've probably, you know, you've probably got on-site burning uh, at that level. And again, we can use insects as well uh, to back all this up and suggest what the data was. So here, again, habitat information and changing uh, vegetational conditions. So what can we learn from submerged forests then? Why is it quite important? So <clears throat> we can look at pollen and charcoal, provide a picture of the tree types that were present during the prehistoric period. Uh, but we want to know about the character. So, for instance, in pollen, uh, we might be able to say that we had a birch hazel woodland. Okay, we've got a birch hazel woodland. But what does that look like? What would it feel to go through that woodland? Would it be quite a dense woodland? Would it be quite an open woodland? What would the ground canopy look like? Uh, you know, <clears throat> would it be quite wet? Would it be quite dry? 
how tricky would it be to traverse through that location? So the idea with the submerged forest is that we can actually get a picture of all of this that we, we can't just get from pollen alone. We also want to know how woodland responded to environmental changes, so things like storm damage, which we can see in the southern estuary, sea level change, groundwater change, the effects of people and animals as well uh, on this woodland. What, what happened to the woodland? How did it demise? How did it begin? How long did it last for uh, as well? So essentially, we want to know what they look like. And it's important to think about that uh, because when we say woodland, we all have a kind of different picture of woodland in our mind. Uh, and that's quite interesting, uh, particularly in terms of when we do reconstruction drawings and try and get an idea of what it was. So I want you all just to kind of close your eyes for 10 seconds or something and get an image of woodland in your head and kind of think about what that looks like. Okay, hopefully you've got that image now. So when we think about woodland, you know, did you, did you think of this woodland? Was it a kind of Lord of the Rings, S woodland, quite a dense woodland? Was that the image in your head? Well, maybe it was this type of woodland, a kind of open scrub woodland. Maybe that's the image that you had. Did anybody have this one? A kind of wet woodland environment, you know, trees quite boggy, quite difficult to traverse through. Or, or maybe even this, a kind of, you know, Vera-esque park woodland, uh, where it's quite sporadic in terms of trees and quite open. And the chances are that in Orkney, during the Mesolithic and the Neolithic, we probably had a mixture of all of these types of woodlands in various places. Uh, across so there is you know so it's quite interesting to talk about a woodland type uh, and get that image in our head so in terms of submerged forest and, and going back to Orkney uh, we want to talk about the site that we've been working on which is down at the Bay of Ireland so it's the blue dot down the bottom uh, just here uh, and when we go back in time we can see that actually that's quite an interesting place to be uh, in the landscape because in the really early Mesolithic uh, you know it was probably part of a, a land bridge uh, across to Hoy, and then in the later Mesolithic, you would have seen uh, that be submerged. So this is the the, the Bay of Ireland, uh, as we've seen, and some students doing their auguring. Uh, and what we wanted to do here is we wanted to take quite an interesting approach. So with the team, we didn't want to just look at the intertidal peat and look at that as you know uh, one segment of a landscape. We wanted to be more integral in that, and we've got quite a key landscape here because, as you can see, with the Ring of Brother there, we're we're right you know within uh, the hinterland of the World Heritage Site. Uh, as well, so uh, and of course the Loch of Stennis. So we wanted to take a slice of the landscape, and we wanted to look at the the maritime zone, uh, the intertidal zone, uh, and also the terrestrial zone. And, and and the terrestrial zone in this aspect is going to be the Loch of Stennis uh, and the records that we can get uh, from there. Uh, because uh, in this instance, uh, the Loch is the best uh, pollen catchment we've got to get quite close to these sites. The, there's not really many uh, peat bogs down here. It's very arable land. So in terms of going out then, uh, <clears throat> this was mainly uh, the role of, of Richard Bates uh, and Martin Bates uh, as well. They've got a lot of uh, experience in, in doing these maritime surveys uh, and also in these offshore coring as well. So we went out uh, in, in the boat from St. Andrews. There's Michelle and Richard uh, in the boat there. This the, the big metal tube you can see is what they used to take the core. So basically uh, it goes uh, off the boat and it has a, a vibrating head that takes it down into the ground uh, when it stops and it goes no further then we pull it out uh, and we hopefully get you know uh, a, a good record that uh, it's about four meters in length there so it's about four meter core at a time uh, that you can get uh, and off the back of it we've also got uh, a sub bottom profiler uh, and this is what we use to record uh, the undersea sediments to try and get an idea on what the landscape's doing uh, under the sea so whether you know it's quite flat at the bottom there whether you might have like an old river channel for example uh, or, or what's going on so again we're looking at the paleotopography now we're looking at you know a lost landscape a mesolithic landscape this is the uh, data from or some of the data from uh, the bay of Ireland. so again this is where it goes into uh, feeds into the lock of stennis uh, so this is the brigle waith going up that way uh, our intertidal peat is over here uh, on this side uh, and this is a, you can see the depth. So what we're seeing here is that, you know, we can see that it's deepest uh, in the middle of the channel and it's shallowing to the sides. Uh, and we did lengths uh, backwards and forwards across here, but also up and down uh, as well with the sub bottom profile. Uh, and this is some of the data. And what we can see here is that we can see that the bottom is quite undulating uh, down here. Uh, we can see it's quite deep. Uh, as well, so we, you know, very tricky to get this core, but also we can see that it's got a shelf uh, on this side. So this side here 
Uh, it's almost this shelf over here. Uh, so here's where the sediments are quite thinnest. Uh, we actually went out and took a core from over here uh, at the time. We didn't get any terrestrial deposits, unfortunately. We only we got three and a half meters of marine sand, uh, which so that wasn't very successful. We also took a call from this side uh, over here uh, where we could get in because you have to anchor yourself or something to keep the boat steady. Uh, so we had a big there was a big raft at the time that was in the middle of the channel that we could anchor off, uh, and then we were able to anchor over here uh, as well. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and we got a call here, and again it was marine sand. So from here you know if we could get out again we would try and take something over here uh and that might be where we could maybe hit some of these terrestrials so what we're trying to do is get a really you know an earliest peat or an earliest uh terrestrial deposit as possible to try and work out when exactly this was submerged uh in in the mesolithic uh and then if it does have peat then again we can get that landscape we can do some pollen we can do some plant macrofossils uh, and get an idea of, of what that landscape would have looked like so at the minute, we haven't quite managed to do that, but we do have now more of an idea of what, what's going on out here. And this was quite important as well for the story of the intertidal peak, because if we could see one of the transects going this way, uh, so imagine uh, that over here now is, is this part here, and over here is going out to sea. What we actually found is that it, it, it dives down, which is what you can see here through the depth, but actually at the end, it rises, and there's a little lip at this end, uh, and that's important because sea level had to get over that to then get into the bay and flood the area. Uh, and so it's quite an important part of the story. So we also have uh, been looking at the intertidal peats. Uh, and the first thing, you know, one of the reasons this site came into our attention was because of this. Uh, and this is an oak trunk uh, that was found in this peat by uh, uh, Ed Pollard, who was the maritime archaeologist at uh, UHI at the time. And he was looking at it in terms of boat remains. So he often walked around these coasts to look to see if he could find bits of boat. Uh, and this is very flat top. So it did look like a potential boat plank. But when we got closer, you could see that actually it's embedded in the peat. And we know most of the peats are Mesolithic, Neolithic. So straight away, we knew this is quite an important uh, uh, tree remain. When we cleaned it up and sectioned it with uh, Anne Crone and <coughs> Keith Barber from AOC, uh, we could actually see that it's got a, a D-shaped profile. So it's actually a radially split oak trunk uh, rather than a plank. Uh, and you can see it's got tapered at both edges uh, as well. Uh, that's pretty much it in terms of the oak that's, that's been found there. That, you know, uh, so it's not a, an in situ tree remnant, but it is, uh, it is a remnant of a tree that's been, that's been uh, worked. Uh, there's very little evidence of, of any tool marks, unfortunately. As you can see, the top of it's been scoured by the sea. It must have been exposed for quite some time. Uh, from, from there. Uh, who knows what else is into the peat in various places, maybe there's some more of this, but at the minute it's, a, it's half an oak split trunk on its own. Uh, this is what it looked like in section, so you can see that's actually embedded uh, in the peat and that peat goes down onto a clay silt. And we took two samples for dendrochronology as well to try and get a date for it. Uh, when we got it out of the ground and turned it over, you can see that it was embedded in a reed swamp environment. So all of these thin ribbons that you see are actually the remnants of reeds uh, from from when it was a reed swamp uh, in, in the uh, in, in the Mesolithic, uh, and you can also see that it's got this weakness in the trunk as well. This kind of crack that runs through it, and it kind of turns and twists through the tree. So here you can see it coming through, and then round. And as soon as we've taken our dendro samples, it kind of split uh, away. So uh, it's now in about six different pieces, unfortunately. Uh, this trunk, but we have recently uh, did some work with Jim. Uh, bright and we we managed to get a photogrammetry model of this so we actually got a model that you can play about with and turn it around we managed to stitch it all back together that way so we do have a nice digital record of this uh, as well that we can we can use in the future uh, as well as still having obviously the trunk itself uh, <clears throat> we didn't get a dendro chronological match from the tree even though it did have a good number of rings uh, so this is the section of the tree you can see that it is that d-shaped profile uh, as well you can see where the pith is as well uh, of the tree. So you can see it's a half. You can see there's a branch or something coming through uh, over here as well, which is probably uh, where that uh, fault was coming through. So you can see the nice rings as well. The rings are quite clear. Uh, unfortunately, there isn't a lot of Mesolithic 
Scottish oaks out there that have been found. So there's very little to compare it against when we think about trying to match it and trying to match it to the overall record. You know, one tree on its own, you don't really get very far. But we we were able to suggest that, you know, it was 125 years old uh, when it died. Uh, it doesn't look like a log boat or anything like that. I'm sure you can agree it's not really got any, any of that kind of intricateness to it. Uh, it is just a split tree. Uh, so in order to get a date, what we did is we, we used the dendrochronology that Anne had done uh, and we managed to get dates from within specific rings uh, as well because we'd already got them out. So we know uh, that, you know, if we get the, 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 the wood from the pith, we know that's going to be the earliest date. And if we get the wood from the outer edge, we know that's going to be the latest date. So we can use these to tie in this end date. So if we only had one of these dates, and this is why it's important when you think of charcoal, because your charcoal could come from any of this, this part of the tree, uh, we can know we know it's only in this one, so we can start working out exactly when it was felled. So you can see where the overlap is, but we because we know one's earlier than the other, we can get a nice end point. So this is then the end point uh, for that felling date, and it gives us a probable felling date of around about four thousand four hundred and ten to four thousand three hundred twenty-five BC. So we can use the the uh, dendrochronology to inform where we take radiocarbon dates, and that's called wiggle matching as well, to try and get as close to you know the actual uh, part of the, the date as possible. Uh, what was it for? Uh, we don't know. Uh, answers on the postcard. You can you can come up with your own theories about this. Uh, I like to postulate that maybe it wasn't laid down vertically, uh, it, uh, sorry, horizontally in the ground, but maybe it was vertical. Uh, and maybe it was a navigation aid. So if you're coming across to the Bay of Ireland from Hoy, for example, and you want to find the Loch of Stennis, then maybe it was a marker point for where the Loch of Stennis was uh, to go uh, along the stream, uh, the Brig of Waith. Uh, there it was, what was it, in height three and a half metres long, uh, thinking about the, the growth of reeds, which can easily hit two metres, one and a half to two metres. It would need to be quite tall to be seen over the top of it. There is examples in Wales where they found half split oaks uh, on top of near, near mountain streams as potential navigational aids. They, the one, one of the ones that was found had some carving on it. We unfortunately don't have any carving and that was only half a meter rather than three and a half meters, but you know, potentially you've got those markers in the landscape. And it's quite interesting to think about that in terms of movement through the, through the, the landscape during the Mesolithic. This is a map of Mesolithic sites uh, in Orkney. Uh, some of it's based on lithic scatters, some of it's based on burning, uh, activity that we see in pollen diagrams, for example. Uh, now we can see there's quite a scatter of these uh, around these. Now with lithic scatters and that, you know, we're not going to get it right down to maybe 30, 40 years. Uh, uh, but you can see that, you know, it kind of points out, you know, if we think this is where the lock of Stennis is, this is where the lock of Harry is. We can see there is activity around these locks and we can start seeing maybe in our eyes, you know, potential pathways, uh, route ways that people were taking, but also just to show that it was quite populated during the Mesolithic, you know, there were people there and they were active uh, in this landscape. And that's where our site is, just there. We've also got trees. These are the submerged forest trees in Orkney. This is what you get. You don't get the nice massive tree trunks and stumps that we have in places like Sussex and Seven Estuary, uh, but we do have these. You can see uh, these are the remains of willow trees, uh, but they're quite large for willow trees. You know, this is, you can see it's been some erosion to it. Uh, you can see the root systems coming out from these. Uh, this is 30 centimetres in length. Uh, so you can see, you know, some of these are up to half a metre uh, in diameter, which is quite a, a significant size for some of these trees. This is the results of the auger survey uh, that we did. Uh, and you can see the tree remains there. And what's quite interesting about this when we think of coastal erosion is that this dotted bit here is when we originally went out in 2012, 2013 uh, and recorded the, uh, the tree the half split uh, oak trunk. Uh, and there's only five uh, or seven, five to seven tree remains that were exposed. So we only recorded about five stumps and they all turned out to be willow, so blue is willow. Then when we went back to do some augering in 2050, uh, the exposure was over here. Uh, so you can see a wider exposure. That This means that the, the, the mud nerves could be shifting off the site. You can see the peak quite easily. Uh, and in the end, we managed to record, I think we up to 27 tree remains now. Uh, from this site, and they've all been willow apart from one solitary birch uh, on its own uh, there as well. So mainly a kind of wet willow uh, car woodland. We also have done our auger surveys. These are some of our auger points. And you can see where it's darkest is where it's deepest. So you can see that actually there are places where you've got this undulating surface where you've got these quite deep bits of deposit and then 
And so you can see peat has formed in these little basins uh, on the land, which is quite interesting uh, and enabled us really to target stuff. So originally we did a bit of work uh, down by the tree trunk and that's been, been published uh, back in 2014, 20, 2014, I think it was 27, no, 2017 uh, here. Uh, and now we've been doing some work on this area as part of this project. So we, we'd identified that the peak's actually about two meters in here. So originally we only looked at 30 centimeters. So two meters, what could we get? Uh, and this was the story. So stratigraphy itself is very important in playing a story uh, and telling you about landscape change, even before you start doing the pollen and the macro fossils and the insects and everything else. Uh, so this is Alanis, one of our uh, students who just finished her master's with us at UHI. Uh, and she helped me uh, dig this pit, test pit uh, in the ground. This was stepped out this way so that you could, you know, it looks quite steep here, but it's actually stepped out quite okay. So you, you, know, you can get in and out uh, without uh, killing yourself or uh, anything else, but uh, it's got a really good sequence. So right at the bottom, it's got this clay layer, uh, which is possibly right to the, to the end of the glacial period, particularly when it's in quite an open area uh, of land, quite wet. Uh, and then what we see is within this kind of little basin, so you have to remember that this isn't in, in a basin area, it starts infilling with vegetation. So at this point, there might be sparse vegetation around the outsides. Uh, and now we're seeing uh, plants coming in here and forming that peat. And here we've got lots of reed fragments. So those fragments that we saw in that trunk are all in here. Uh, and then eventually it becomes a wood peat and you can just about make out in the section uh, these little bits here, these are wood remains coming through. Uh, so you can see those wood remains coming through and again these are kind of willow wood that's going here. So this is our period of, of tree remains. So <clears throat> they're, they're, you know, if we look at the foreshore we're up here somewhere so if you did a line out that's where you'd find them uh, down the slope uh, across. Uh, so this is where our, tree, our submerged forest is. And then you can see it's a massive change. Something very dramatic happens because this is our peak. And then you can see quite a clear line uh, and into a silt. And this is a, this is a freshwater silt. Uh, so we've, our woodland's completely disappeared now. And it looks like we've had a, a freshwater pool develop on top of that. And this is, this is not uh, marine. Uh, and then it fluctuates. So what you can see here is that we've got these laminations, we've got these bands. So you can see where it's quite dark. And then you can see our silk quite clearly. And then we have, it goes back to peat again. So every now and again, it's an open pool of water, then it's in filling, and it's an open pool of water, then it's in filling, and it's an open pool of water. So, it, you know, we've got that kind of change happening quite frequently. Uh, so I think it's probably quite a shallow open pool of water, but, you know, it is changing quite, uh, quite a lot. Uh, and then at the, at the top here, we've got this layer of really quite jumbled, quite coarse material. There's quite large stone clasts in this and they're quite, uh, some of them are quite angular uh, as well. And it's very sandy, very clay, uh, very marine clay. And this looks like it's a big storm surge deposit. So when we're thinking of storminess, we do have this evidence of storminess coming in uh, and we've got this big deposit on top of it. And then afterwards, it goes back to this peat again. So it goes back to being a, a wetland, a kind of peat wetland. Uh, and then at the top, we don't have that silt layer, unfortunately, to say that's exactly when it became marine. But we do have, you know, quite a, a nice sequence here. So to get just over two meters of, of sequence from an intertidal location, you know, that's very good, uh, very good indeed. And Eliza did the Beatles, so she ended up uh, loving the Beatles. Not sure she still loves the Beatles, but she, still, she did when she was doing the project anyway. Uh, this is the pollen results uh, from that test pit. So the key thing is really is some of the dates uh, so we've got radiocarbon dates throughout this sequence. This is the clay, this is the repeat, this is the wood peat, this is that freshwater silt that fluctuated, this is our storm deposit, and this is the peat then at the top. Uh, our radiocarbon dates at the bottom, uh, you know, these are in dates BP, so we're looking at uh, a late Mesolithic date uh, down the bottom. Uh, our date for this change, this sedimentary change, is around about 3500 BC, so we're talking uh, you know, be, beginning of the Neolithic, really, in Orkney. Uh, and then at the top, uh, our peat is uh, 600 BC. So, you know, for a lot of intertidal peats in Orkney, we're talking Mesolithic, Neolithic. Here we're talking late Mesolithic all the way up until, you know, pretty late Bronze Age, uh, almost into the Iron Age uh, here. So we've got a really detailed sequence. There's a few key things in here to see. Uh, you notice that there's big burning events going on. So here's our charcoal. Uh, we've got charcoal at different sizes. So here's the largest size of charcoal and here's the smallest size in charcoal. And you can see, you know, big burning events going through uh, these two zones. This is when it's in the reed swamp. This is when we've got reed uh, and tree remains here. 
Uh, what are they burning? Uh, well, we've got some charcoal. So this is some of the charcoal that you see here. This is a big piece of charcoal, but you, as you can see, it's retained structure. And what you might be able to make out are these little windows. And within these windows, there's these little lines coming through. Uh, and these are stomata. So this is uh, Phragmite stomata. This is reed stomata. So we know they're actually burning the reeds. They're not burning the, the wood here. They're actually burning the reed swamp uh, within these events. And you can see one uh, later on uh, as well. Uh, we've also got peaks in dung fungi coming through, uh, which kind of correlate with when the burning events going on. So when we think about whether you know this is deliberate burning to promote the vegetation, so to promote new shoots that would uh, then be edible uh, for animals, uh, this could be one of the reasons. You know, we see this uh, being put forward in, in Mesolithic sites throughout the UK. So that could be one reason for doing it. Uh, <clears throat> One of the things we don't know in Orkney, though, is we don't really know what the Mesolithic fauna of Orkney was. We don't have a lot of bone evidence from this period in time. Uh, so one of the things that we've done for this core is that we've actually taken environmental DNA samples through here to try and correspond with these peaks uh, in dung fungi to see if we, you know, if we manage to get some uh, DNA evidence uh, of this uh, fecal material that might tell us what animals were around to see, for example, if we have deer. Uh, during the Mesolithic, we think, you know, we know they were there during the Neolithic. Were they brought across by Neolithic people or were they already deer here? So these are the kind of things that we're still hoping to find out from this site. We don't have those answers yet. This is the period where it switches. So you can see here around about 3500 BC, there's a big switch from the woodland into uh, a loch uh, environment. And here we start seeing an increase in algae uh, as well. So that tells us that we've got standing water on the site at this point. And we've done diatoms through this as well. And the diatoms also show this is fresh water. Uh, and here's our evidence of uh, storm damage. This takes place in the Middle Bronze Age where we have this uh, storm event. Uh, but what's interesting is that straight after the storm event, we've still got things like cereal pollen uh, present and we've got burning evidence. So it's just that, you know, people weren't abandoning this area even though you've got these changes taking place. I mean, you know, uh, so there is evidence potentially of, you know, resilience of human communities to, uh, you know, big storm surges and everything at this time. We had a student from Leiden uh, look at a few samples for the waterlogged plant remains. Uh, and as you can see, they're, they're beautifully preserved. You know, these are seeds that, you know, wouldn't look out of place if you went and found them uh, today. Uh, we only looked, the student only looked at three samples through. So these are from the Mesolithic into the early Neolithic. So these are kind of, this is when we've got the reed swamp. This is kind of concurrent with some of our tree remains that are present there. Uh, and you can see just from the variety. So we're looking here at 100 mils. Uh, a cubic of, uh, of, of sample and there's lots and lots of different types here so we've got some really nice things like Shenoplectus here uh, we get stems of the reed as well these cool no fragments uh, we've got nice things like potting mcgeaton seeds uh, as well and bog beans very shiny seeds so we've got some really good potential here to find out really lots of nice information on a very local level about what uh, vegetation changes are happening and these also then feed in to the woodland in terms of telling us what the field layer is and it gives us more of a chance of matching these to any comparisons we can make with the national vegetation communities uh, information as well we also did some insects through these so uh Alanis did these supervised by steve davis from ucd uh, and here's some of the results from the the lower half of that peat bog so again this is the period when we've got uh woodland uh, and we've got reed swamp and you can see uh, a lot of the categories of beetles that were found were these wetland uh, types. We've got a lot of wet types. We've got a lot of aquatic types showing that the surface is actually very wet. We've got a few that are uh, associated with trees. Not so many. There's not a lot of beetles that are specifically associated with willow and with birch. Uh, but we do have a lot of disturbed ground as well. So, you know, that might correlate with our burning evidence. Uh, we've got a few dry, uh, in the case of dry land and that, but, you know, mainly a wet woodland habitat, uh, which is showing up. And we've got some nice remains. So these are uh, thorax remains uh, of, of beetles that are associated with uh, mainly with uh, with wetland and fen conditions, uh, and these are what the beetles would have looked like uh, as well. And I think this one's quite rare now uh, as well. It's kind of uh, rare, rare in the UK, but you know maybe uh, had a large community uh, in in the Mesolithic uh, in Orkney. So this is what essentially that story is telling us about this: is that we had this reed swamp uh, into a car woodland. So during this time, we know people are knocking about. We know they're burning the reeds. Uh, we know they're putting oak timbers 
into that environment for whatever reasons. Uh, and then we've got this woodland developing in the, in the Neolithic. And then by the, the mid, sort of mid Neolithic, we're, we're losing that. Uh, and we're getting replaced with this environment uh, as well. Uh, it's kind of a freshwater uh, lock environment that sort of infills and then com comes around again and infills again uh, as well. So we're seeing, you know, it's quite a dynamic change to lose that woodland so rapidly. We've also been doing some community archaeology down there, and here's Caroline uh, with some volunteers. Uh, and it's quite interesting for them to see some test pits through the peat because normally, you know, it's a dryland site uh, and you're going through the archaeology. This gives you a chance to really get in hands on with some organic materials. And one of the things that they were finding quite frequently within the peats were hazelnut shells. So we don't have any hazel trees there, but we do find hazelnuts. Uh, so that's just there is hazel you know, present in the wider landscape. Uh, and maybe you're getting things like squirrels or, or voles uh, and that taking nuts and burying them within there. We certainly saw a lot of that in the Seven Estuary, but we should expect it really because, you know, the UHI logo, after all, uh, is uh, actually a, a squirrel. So we should really expect to find uh, some of these hazelnuts knocking about. Uh, we've done some work uh, on the inland site, so looking at the, the, the Loch of Stennis. Uh, and particularly, you know, sort of interest because of tying in with the, the mess of Brodga and, and that amazing archaeology. Uh, so they've been out and they've taken some cores uh, from this lock. I think they've taken about eight or nine cores uh, so far. And again, you've got this floating raft that's anchored down uh, and that uh, metal tube uh, with a vibrating head comes through here uh, and then it goes down into the riverbed. We try and stand it up as straight as possible and then it drives down. Uh, and then once it doesn't go any further, we bring it up and here's some of the you know, results you can get uh, from these sediments uh, in the core once it's cut open. There has been some pollen started on this. So Michelle Farrell and Jane Bunting are doing some pollen uh, from the Loch of Stennis and we've got some uh, results. And again, you can see there is large landscape change is going on. Uh, so this is around about, you know, similar time to we're seeing that loss of woodland at the Bay of Ireland and that start of uh, terrestrial uh, locks uh, going on. Uh, we see there's a, there's a real decline in woodland as well, uh, you know, into the terrestrial zone here. Now we do need more dates on this course. So we're going to, get more dates uh, for these cores to, to really try and tie our chronology in uh, so we can match it right against the Bay of Island. And then, you know, if we ever get one in, in the marine zone, we can match it against that as well. But we also have things like uh, arable indicators coming in. So grassland coming in, uh, plantago, lanceolata, that sort of thing. So, uh, and, and cereal pollen uh, as well. So, you know, as we see this loss in woodland, we are seeing uh, agriculture taking place. And we do, you know, we have naked barley grains, uh, a few sparse emigrants uh, from uh, the uh, nests of Brodka. So people are cultivating in this landscape. So we're starting to get a bit of evidence for that. Uh, and if you put all this in together, it's just, you know, we have got quite a dynamic change that's going on, you know, right from the beginning of the, the Neolithic uh, in Orkney around this time with sea levels, you know, still rising. We're getting this change in hydrology locally that's changing woodlands into locks, you know, and we're, and we're seeing evidence of people in the landscape, but also evidence of storminess and things as well. So the challenges that people face as well. So we're starting to build this nice picture now about how people adapted to that landscape, how the landscape is changing and the resilience of those communities. So that's all starting to come together really nicely. And over the next few years, we'll be tying this all up and, and getting our papers out on it. So expect them to appear uh, in journals uh, not too far into the future now. Uh, and then I thought I'd round up by showing some of the work we've been doing in the Western Isles as well. Uh, so here we've been looking at a site uh, at Leonaclet uh, in Benbecula. Uh, and I was talking earlier about the fact that even though a lot of the studies that have been done on submerged forests are antiquarian studies, we can still use that information to kind of plot uh, where these sites are. So we don't really have a, a detailed peat map for Scotland to show where these intertidal peats are located. So I had a student uh, who's just finished their master's, another student, Lynn Brown, who looked at plotting uh, intertidal peat locations across the west, west of Scotland uh, and into the Western Isles. And here's some of the data that she produced. So she found 60 sites uh, pretty much uh, around uh, the Western Isles. So this gives you an idea of intertidal peat sites uh, in these locations. You can see sites that have archeology span uh, related to them and also a lot of sites with no archeology. span uh, And then we've also got uh, sites here that have got dates, so blues, uh, sorry, red squares have radiocarbon dates and blues don't have any radiocarbon dates. So you can see there's still quite a lot out there that, uh, that are undated, that we don't know about, that may have archaeology, that archaeology is at risk because of coastal erosion as well. So we looked at a site that had both those things, it had an undated peat, it had tree remains, and it had archaeology. So it's based down here 
as well. So we'll take that away again. So it's round back number 39. So you can see there. And the dates are the, are the new dates that we've got for it. So there has been work previously on true remains in Scotland. So this is by uh, Fawcett in, in 96, uh, his paper. And he plotted all the tree remains that they'd found. So as you can see, there's a lot of wood remains uh, that are found in peat bogs from across uh, the Western Isles. Uh, can zoom in a bit and have a look. So P is pine, S is salix, uh, willow, B is betula, A is alder. Uh, <clears throat> there's also yews that are around that's unidentified. So you can see yew here, we can't, we don't, there's not enough the tree left to actually be able to identify it properly. Uh, so we know there's, there is woodland there and some of that has been, uh, been looked at and, and identified. There's also uh, hazel. So these are the sort of trees that we have. This is where our site is in comparison. It's actually, uh, there's a yew there. Uh, in this study, so it was unidentified at the time. Uh, this is pine, so we've got pine remnants. So again, we had potential pine in, in, in Orkney from uh, William Watts uh, <coughs> studies, but we, we've got none of that left now. We've not found any pine yet in submerged forests in, in Orkney uh, uh, presently. This is where the pine's located in the US, so you can see it's mainly located in, in North US. Uh, hazel has been found, but it's the nuts that have been found. So again, just like in Orkney, it's not the tree remains that are being found, but it is actually the hazelnuts. Uh, here's alder. So there's a couple of sites with alder. Again, it's mainly in uh, the north, the north east. Here's willow. So there's a lot of willow trees that have been found. And again, willow is the predominant tree in Orkney. There's lots of uh, willow uh, woodland in the inside of peaks there. And then also birch as well. Uh, so birch is through there. So you can see where our site is based. Uh, going with the data that's already been collected, we should expect to have birch and willow woodland uh, on that site. Here are the trees. So you can see here, we've got some bigger tree remains than we had in these peats uh, in Orkney. We've also got, you know, you can see the extent of the uh, intertidal peat at Leonicle, and that'll be uh, even uh, more obvious in, the, in some of the coming photos. Uh, lots of big woodland remains. Uh, this uh, area was identified to scape by some of the, the local community. Uh, in Benbecula, and it was an area they were interested in, and of course I'm interested in awesome much forests, so I was quite keen to go and have a look at it, uh, and we even uh, took students there on a field trip to have a look at it uh, as well. So we managed to take some samples there uh, of the wood. We did the wood ID uh, workshop, so here's uh, everybody out uh, on the uh, foreshore there. So this was done with scape and with uh, local community, uh, and here we're setting up grid squares. So we did 10 by 10 meter grid squares, uh, and people went round and they recorded all the trees in their grid square. So we drew them, we recorded them, we GPS them, and then we took a wood ID sample so that we could actually say what trees uh, were present in, in these locations. Uh, here's everybody out doing their recordings. People worked in pairs uh, uh, as well, and they had a little kit. So they had recording uh, sheets, uh, they had tape measures, they had sample bags, etc., uh, to be able to take these. Uh, and here's some of the tree remains coming out from the side. So uh, what was quite interesting, I haven't got uh, the finish, we haven't finished the map yet for this uh, to draw it up, but we did have willow and birch, uh, unsurprisingly, given uh, the, the data, the previous data on it, but we also had pine. Uh, and this is one of the pine trees just coming out of the peat shelf here. And you can see quite clearly the rings coming through this really nicely uh, on, on this uh, tree main. So it actually, if we go back briefly, you can see that this was the previous known location of pine but now we've been able to stretch it all the way down you know uh, to Benbecula uh, almost into South Hughes to say that actually pine probably was pretty prominent across most of uh, the Western Isles uh, uh, during the Mesolithic, Neolithic. Uh, there's also a lot of archaeology uh, down there as well uh, so we're this is towards the foreshore we're down here somewhere looking at some edge forests uh, but there's also potential uh, structures you can just about make out some walls uh, through here uh, coming around. There's a saddle quern that was found as well. This saddle quern uh, that was just found on the, on the, on the peach shelf, really nice. Uh, there's more possible structures down here. You can just about see some walls coming through. Uh, and then we had a midden, a uh, potential butchery site over here with lots of uh, animal bone and, and also quartz, uh, lithics and flakes as well. And we've got some dates for these now. So potentially we've got, you know, the peat beneath the wall, uh, as you can see, is Neolithic, suggesting that, you know, it can't be uh, any earlier than that peat. Uh, animal bone uh, and the peat shelf here is Bronze Age, uh, and we don't have any dates yet for these structures, I don't think. So we've got you know, potential uh, prehistoric uh, uh, communities living in this area, uh, probably after the period uh, that the uh, 
that the uh, <coughs> trees were, were, were present. Uh, we've done a small bit of pollen work from here. So this is the top uh, and this is the, it's the bottom of the peat area. So this is actually the inside of peat with the tree remains. So you can see here, it's only 24 centimeters. So again, you know, uh, having two meters in Orkney is a luxury really when compared to uh, some place where you only get a few centimeters. Uh, and you can see that we've got dates, uh, BC dates. So, you know, we're in the Neolithic, uh, <laughs> beginning of the Neolithic here uh, and the sort of, uh, so towards the end of the Neolithic here and into the, the Neolithic here. So we've got a Neolithic submerged forest. Uh, we can see there's quite a bit of willow pollen. So that goes along with the, the trees. There's birch and there's pine. These will probably change and expand as we go through. This is just 100 counts. So we want to get these up to 500 pollen grains per level. Uh, and there's not many levels done. But again, lots of burning evidence uh, coming through uh as well so you know this kind of burning within these wetland environments seems to be uh, pretty ubiquitous across these areas uh is this where our tree woodland starts so again we can start seeing peaks in, in, in willow pollen here uh, and, and other trees uh we do have some evidence of dung fungi so we might have animals grazing uh, again within this woodland environment and again we've got a kind of decline in woodland up here so it's, there's something happened here so we need to fill in the gaps to say, you know, does something happen here uh, in terms of causing a, a loss of woodland? And you can see, you know, there's also a loss in birch here, but pine is just picking up here as well. So these will change, but you can see that we are picking up the main taxa that we've identified in the wood IDs here. Uh, what has been completed is the insects. So Alanis, uh, again, has done the insects for these. Uh, again, this is the, the periods from uh, the submerged forest, so it's within this zone. And you can see there's actually quite a good level of insects within here. Uh, and again, we've got uh, quite a few aquatic species uh, that are coming through. We also have species that like fenland as well. So this kind of wet floor woodland, you know, uh, is quite interesting. It's quite interesting to think about that in terms of pine because pine normally doesn't don't like very wet conditions. It normally likes, you know, fairly a bit more drier conditions. So maybe the pine's growing on, you know, sort of little raised parts of, of the woodland floor. And we do have some woodland species as well. So we do have tree beetles that we like to use. And again, if we think about these, and reconstruct them we can start you know putting together our faunal assemblage uh, of insects through these and these are quite important as well because these are you know these are the first kind of biodiversity records for Orkney and the Western Isles in terms of these uh, insect assemblages uh, so they're really you know we can look at what's living there now and go back in the past to see if they're the same species or has temperature changed and they've moved on uh, for example as well so we're getting these nice biodiversity records uh, and then the last slide to finish off on uh, really is this one. Uh, we got the school kids involved. Uh, they all went out onto the inside of Peach Elf. We told them to wear wellies, so obviously they all turned up in trainers. Uh, and we asked them to, to stand uh, on a tree and be a tree. So it gives you some indication of, of woodland density uh, as well, uh, of those tree remnants. And you can see people holding out their arms being trees. So you can see actually the trees are quite clustered in some areas. And in some stretches, we don't have uh, that evidence. Maybe we've lost trees from there. But it gives you, again, you know, if you're walking through there, you know, it would be quite a wet, squelchy uh, woodland with trees of various height as well, because the pine would be up and then you might have, you know, smaller willow trees below that. So all of this data enables us really to uh, reconstruct these uh, woodland canopies from the past. And that's it. Uh, thanks to the funders uh, and the work continues. Uh, and we've got uh, one paper out where we're writing up another one uh, as we speak. Uh, and hopefully uh, a couple of years time, we'll see uh, a flurry uh, of these coming out of these areas.